Hi, this is Ed, and I'm in San Diego, California, and today is January 18, a little after 7 a.m. here on the coast, and the rain has stopped, the sun is out, and uh, I have to tell you, we drove, Joanne and I drove from Phoenix, not last night, but the night before, which is like a six, six and a half hour drive over the mountains in eastern san diego county and it was desert on the other side and we got up through the mountains and there was rain the temperature dropped 20 degrees i thought we were going to slide off the mountains <laughs> and it, it was like a unbelievable drive the last hour and a half but here we are safe and sound in san diego it's really terrible weather but uh it looks like it's going to be good and will dry out here in southern california so um we have an all-star cast here, and I'm really honored, and we'll be joined by a couple of others as the show progresses. Um, everyone will have a chance to speak. Everyone will have a chance to connect. Uh, Gary Sanga has just sent everybody a memo in the chat about how to put your name on this visible screen here. And I welcome you and invite you all to share your website or your LinkedIn, your email, uh, ask any question to anybody. Your ROI will definitely be in these connections going forward. To facilitate that as a producer, uh, broadcast host, I welcome you all back and to subsequent productions as we go forward. Uh, I've been fortunate since uh, uh, early, Jan early 2020, well, late January, February, when we launched Global TV Talk Show .com, we have produced 550 something programs and generating an audience of 212,000 uh, in over 100 countries. And it wouldn't be possible without people like yourselves who are willing to come and use time and energy. Of course, the benefit is meeting people and getting good PR. So. I feel the responsibility as the producer here, uh, as a developer of the product, I feel the weight of the responsibility to deliver news and information uh, in a non-political, strictly business way. And we welcome you to think of someone else who you may know who might be good on this kind of a format. Not everybody likes this. Yeah. OK, but and not everybody can do it because they're camera shy or whatever. Um, uh, we have a number of interesting people uh, in our network. Uh, this program will be seen through the marketing, subsequent marketing distribution and exhibition across our YouTube channel, our uh, LinkedIn networks, Facebook group, Instagram and whatever. More than 100,000 will watch this program in the coming weeks because we'll make sure it gets into their hands. Whether or not they watch the whole darn thing, <laughs> I have no control over that. A lot has to do with you, our presenters and our masterminds, as I'm calling you, because of your unique talents and your unique, unique perspectives. Let's start off. Yvonne Quay is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with uh, the World Bank Group, uh, based in the headquarters city of Washington, her role specifically is manager, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Yvonne, manager of the family network within the bank. So this is a little separate from the bank itself, isn't it, Yvonne? You're mm, on mute. Yes, yeah, uh, okay, yes. I, I'm actually the <clears throat> program advisor. So there is somebody else about me, but I basically look after globally mobile populations and you know all the different shapes and forms that they come in. But my main expertise is dual career, because as, as we all know, getting talent to the right place at the right time, and also uh, getting women uh, into the uh, echelons of leadership uh, as they manage uh, a dual careers, because usually they too are married to uh, partners who have high powered careers. So how do you do that? And our uh, organization requires a lot of mobility. And so that is a challenge when you have two high powered careers. Yeah. So your, your um, customers are the executives, uh, the, the senior managers and their family. Uh, everybody, everybody. Uh, I think. Yeah. And so th there's a lot of relocation that goes on, right? Yes. Yeah. So I want you to meet James Moss. 
absolute relo. James, raise your hand, say hi. Hi, James. Yeah. Hey, he, how are you doing? He, he's originally from London, and that's where we met a long time ago when he uh, helped me organize and he spoke at uh, some of my London conferences a long time ago. He's now in the U.S. several years and now bouncing back and forth. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that that's exactly right. I mean, um, what what I do is is uh, mobile on your phone global relocation, which which really focuses on really how people's work lives have changed, uh, mm -hmm. combined with how people communicate. And um, I think. Well, we, the world has changed a great deal. It was changing before COVID. Then we had COVID come along. Yeah. Um, now we have other you know, significant global events going on, such as the, uh, the the war in the Ukraine and so on, which has yeah. been a massive impact across across the world. And so I, I, I want you to all uh, uh, use your your chat, if I may jump in here. To, I, I have to move this along. Uh, but uh, we'll certainly double back to you, and we welcome you to interject any thoughts going forward. Yvonne has a hard close in 10 minutes or so. So, Yvonne, uh, your book, um, I'm going to put you on big view here so everyone can see. Uh, <laughs> okay, Yvonne, um, tell us about your book. Well, my book is about dual, uh, dual careers and how you make those decisions. Uh, you know, whose career is it? Yours, mine, or ours, as the, as the title says. And of course, that is a very hard discussion to make. Uh, sometimes I've realized since writing of the book, there is also a genderized decision that is made uh, mainly on an unconscious level, actually, that uh, I was thinking, uh, you know, about what I would, uh, uh, some of the decision-making traps, like a financial trap. So a rush decision is made. I've been asked to go to country X and I come home and I have to decide. So who's earning more now? Okay, you're, you're earning a hundred thousand, I'm earning 50,000. So, okay, you get to pick. And this kind of short term perspective or you get the priority, so to speak, because that's a financial trap. And we actually haven't thought of the long term. We haven't thought about, is this what we want to do? So it, it is, in the end, about the life we want. Because I think, as James said earlier, particularly since COVID, I think people have become much more conscious about well-being, about what do I want to do with life. And a lot of people are saying, we don't want it to be completely absorbed with uh, work. And so therefore you've then got to recalibrate and make different decisions, right? So. Okay, so let's bring in Matthias. Uh, please meet Yvonne. I Yvonne, do you have a uh, World Bank people in Germany? I, I would assume you do. Uh, uh, no, actually, oh. uh, uh, because it's not, it's not a developing country. We don't have a country program. Sometimes we have hubs where we put a lot of people and they move out from there. But uh, no, we don't have anything in Germany. I see. Okay. Um, so I want you to meet Matthias and also Hi, Dave, Dave Levine. Uh, they're in uh, employee assistance plans. And yes. I'm, sure, I'm sure you utilize that kind of a service. Yeah. Hi, Yvonne. I'm happy to hear you. Um, maybe not so far you don't have a destination in Germany, but there might be sometimes. Uh, from an EAP perspective, Germany is seen as um, the motor of the economic of Europe. So uh, right these days, a lot of EAP, global uh, EAP provider try to get to Germany and to work from Germany all over Europe. So maybe that could be also next next step. I'm not pretty sure, but if you need any hands, I would be glad to help you out. Thank you. Thank you. So um, it's 23 going to be different for you and uh, the bank's uh, family network or a continuation of? Well, I think old... we, we are trying to work out now what would be the best way forward post COVID, looking at our members' needs. Uh, looking at the mix between in-person and virtual events, because in an odd sort of way, uh, 
there is a mixed response. Some people are dying to, 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 for everything to go back to the past and face to face and things. And other people have said, hey, we've moved on. You know, there are lots of benefits with virtual. And so trying to, to make sure that we address the needs of, 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 of our, our members. And of course, it, it's very nuanced because we have 140 countries. So it's not the same in every place. Yeah. So I'm sure you're busy in Ukraine. Uh, we have moved our people. I think some have gone back. I'm not entirely sure. But a lot of uh, people initially were moved to Vienna. Yeah, that makes sense. So, Chris Exline, um, when do you go into uh, Ukraine? Uh, I fly to Krakow tomorrow and then first thing Friday morning. Um, I go uh, across the border, walk across the, the land bridge there, and uh, the driver will meet me and take me uh, back home to Kremenitz on Friday for lunch. <laughs> uh, Chris, is your family with you in Ukraine? I'm curious. Uh, you know what? That's a very good question. I don't talk about my family in Ukraine. Um, sure. One, because I'm, and I'll, I'll be honest with you on this group, I, I'm openly gay. Uh, my uh, my my partner is a uh, is, is living in Hong Kong, and we think that it would be highly inappropriate for us to uh, go over there and make this about our lifestyle more than about what we're trying to do through uh, building a new business, saving jobs, adding jobs, and participating in the reconstruction. Uh, having said that, um, you know he's very supportive of what I'm doing. Um, we've made the decision as a couple. Uh, that will keep our homes in Hong Kong. He will actually, he's a, he's a, he's a singer. So he's going to go to Taipei where he can do a TV show. But, you know, so it, we, we, we worked on this as a, because a, as you know, Home Essentials is involved in relocation through furniture rental. And, you know, as a couple, we worked through this because my commitment to Ukraine, the company's commitment to Ukraine is, is three to five years, if not longer. So how do we as a couple maintain our family um, by being separated. But I mean, as you know, Ukraine is not perhaps the, the friendliest to our lifestyle and nor would I ever, ever want my lifestyle to be a topic of, of consideration or saying, hey, you have to accept me because I'm the factory owner or because I've brought this business here. It's all about helping and participating with them. And so I'm very grateful that Hugo has been so supportive of what I'm doing, enthusiastic about what we're doing because he's seen the, the, the effects that we've had on, on these people where they're just happy to have jobs. I mean, when we're delivering these mattresses to refugees, they just want to, we're, we're, we're meeting them at their place of need. Oh yeah. And we've been able to do this as a business. And I've also had, I have to say, I've had tremendous support from all of the other home essentials uh, uh, people around the world that are supportive of what we're doing. And I couldn't do this without them. And, um, you know, and so they're seeing that, you know, we're actually, we're actually, we don't know when victory will come and we don't know what victory will look like, but as a company and, you know, since I'm, I don't have a board or shareholders, I'm able to say, you know what, we're going to do this. I will be there and, and we will be there for as long as it takes laying the infrastructure, building out the organization, rounding out the supply chain, learning the oper operational realities of doing business in Ukraine so that when victory does occur, when relocation does occur, when the contractors come in, we'll, we'll be prepared and ready to assist them. That's really okay. interesting. So I, I want to be, before Yvonne has to dash, I, I want to make sure everybody can connect with Yvonne, use the chat, Gary Sanger. Um, have you done any work with the World Bank? I have colleagues in my uh, search alliance, which is Kestria, 45 countries, 90 cities. So the answer is yes. Secondly, the answer is, Chris, I would love <coughs> we have alliances with fellow partners in Ukraine in terms of search. I'd love to see how we might assist. I, you know, I, I text regularly with my colleagues there in Ukraine. And uh, do you need my resume? I, <laughs> I do. Wow, I do. Ed, thank you so much for this call. I didn't know I was going to get a job. No, but the idea is, are you safe? Are you okay? Is your family fine? You know, and they off, she often says, Natalia Slinko is her name. She's a wonderful lady. Uh, we have no electricity. We have no water, but we have our freedom. And here mm -hmm. she is, a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old um, 
boy and girl, and husband is out supporting the country. I'm just so empathetic. And so how you and your mattress company and how we could help these folks, this could be anywhere in our backyards, anywhere in our communities. And um, I just, for one, would like to get fully supportive on how we make your mattress company successful there because these folks, they're trying to sleep. They're trying to stay safe. They're trying to uh, you know, have water. And here we might be worried about our internet connection or you know, the paper was late. I'm uh, totally empathetic as to what we have with our friends and neighbors in the Ukraine. Thank Gary, you, thank Gary. you for that. And, I, and Ed, Ed, I, I want to I want to talk on this for a second because having moved to Ukraine, um, I have experienced four days without water, uh, without electricity, without heat, where it's below freezing in my own apartment. Um, you know, and 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 it if it has an impact on every single person living in that nation, and this. Uh, evil endeavor of knocking out the energy grid, people with aneurysms that need dialysis, that may have a stroke, they cannot get the care that they need. So it, it really does uh, have deleterious consequences for millions of people that are there. And I'm not saying anything about people that aren't in Ukraine or people that are you know, upset about internet connections, but for the people that are living there, I can tell you that they are resolute in their love of the freedom for their nation uh, their will is not broken. And when they emerge from this, uh, they will be absolutely the best, uh, among the best workforce in Europe. I have to be careful what I'm saying because I'm, I'm in Madrid. So if somebody hears me, I don't want them to think that I'm comparing them as a bad workforce. But uh, uh, with all due respect, I mean, the, the resolve of the Ukrainian people, I, I can tell you this, if I wasn't in this small town, if I was just based in Kiev, I'd have, Kiev is totally different from these small towns. I mean, this is as different as being from say Chicago or New York to being in Nashua, New Hampshire or, or you know, Mount Vernon, uh, Ohio or, or Cadillac, Michigan. These, these people are just bonded and, and, and they just care about their country. Uh, our town has 40% unemployment, 20,000 people, 3,500 refugees. And so Home Essentials has delivered about 2,000 mattresses thus far, and we should deliver another 2,000 by the end of March. Um, but, uh, you know, and that's, and that's where it all starts. So um, it's not, no, 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 it's, it's not about what we're doing. It's just about, I think you're going to see a lot of other companies uh, see that it's okay to invest in Ukraine, and now's the time to do so. Yeah, everybody share your contact details using the chat. Uh, Yvonne, I know you've got to scoot. Uh, so before you go, um, what do you have coming up? Uh, are you are you going to be on travel? Oh, you're mute. Right. At, the, at, the, at the moment, we're, we're still here. So uh, we've got nothing really uh, uh, scheduled at, at the minute. So we will probably uh, go to Europe, you know, in the next few months, but we're, we're here for at, at this minute for now. Yeah. But Chris, I, I just want to say, you know, please let me know if I can help. I'm really inspired by what you say. And there's nothing like hardship, I think, to, to bring up character. And wow, I mean, we haven't even begun. I don't think, I, I feel that, you know, rather, um, what do you say? I, I wouldn't say weak, but I'm humble to hear how, 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 how wonderful and courageous these people are, I guess. Their, their courage is astounding, their, their ability to keep the focus in view of such adversity. Wow. Wow is all that I can say. Yeah, good. Well, thank you, Yvonne, for your time today. And I welcome you to uh, be back on global TV talk shows. In mid-May, we're going to produce a, a series of in-person meetings across Europe um and the, and we're working on all the details now and if you're in europe in mid-may mid then certainly i would welcome you uh, well, you. we'll be in hamburg we'll be in london we'll be in paris um maybe amsterdam or rotterdam i'm not sure um but in switzerland and we'll end up in milano um and um, each meeting will be broadcast as well as be in person um fantastic and, we and, get and unique yeah, I know. We've never met in person. <laughs> so that's great. So thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, so everybody, this is Emily Braun. She's currently in Toronto, but she is originally from um, Moldova or someplace over there, right?
Yes, and lived in Ukraine, and I was really happy uh, to connect with Chris before this meeting. And Chris, as I told to you, uh, you would be different. You're already a different person. So after a year or so living in Ukraine under such circumstances, you will be really um, super version of yourself, I would say. It's not that I would like to diminish what you are now, but it's this experience, it's really you know, special. And if you need uh, more, you know, connections, contact from my side in Kiev, in Eastern um, Ukraine, you will um, discover new sides of Ukraine as well. Yes, that's great. Okay. Uh, and I want to make sure everybody knows Tineke Renson. So, so Tineke, your primary job, your role in life is to help women business leaders become uh, more, right? True, yes. I'm uh, situated in the Netherlands. Um, so for it's becoming dark, it's afternoon here. Um, yes, I, I became passionate for this topic because um, often it became very natural to me doing business, building businesses. I was always supported by male uh, business owners. Um, and I am seeing that they do different, have a different way of doing business. Uh, it's very structured, it's very goal oriented. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things that don't become that natural to, to women. Um, it's not things we cannot learn. I, I learned them because I was surrounded by men all the time. A lot of my team members, when I was employing people, were men. Uh, we were in the outdoor and survival uh, industry. So I can say the first half of my year, I learned from men, uh, even a bit longer until my 30s, 40s. Now I'm learning so much about how women are operating and I can see the benefits of both. I can see the struggles of both. I can also see the struggles of them collaborating together sometimes, not always. Um, and I focused uh, helping business women because it's my strong belief that there, there has to be more support for women in business. Uh, you know, we're, we're all, we all agree that we need more women in politics, that we need more women in boardrooms. I'm an advocate for women building bigger businesses for the same, same reason. Um, because we do the, uh, business um, sometimes in a different way. Uh, and what I love about the era we live in now, especially Western countries, the, the feminine uh, traits are now growing. Uh, there's a lot of men who are interested in, in this as well. And I've already heard it here and I see it in the way pe uh, men here communicate and want to support and want to collaborate. That's a feminine trait. Women do that naturally, men learn it because, you know, it benefits. Uh, and at some point they love doing it because it makes you feel good. Um, so I'm, I'm all about um, under, helping people to understand those two uh, things, but especially towards the benefit of women becoming more seen, heard and do and be the way they are and become successful the way they are. Thank you. I want to introduce Sandrine Bardot, who's just joined us from Dubai. Sandrine, unmute yourself and say hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry for being late. Um, I got another call and uh, couldn't uh, make it shorter. I'm happy to be here. It's been a while. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, yes. So uh, Sandrine and I have known each other since 1999, and, <laughs> and uh, she was a speaker at our um, first meeting, live meeting in Paris. And at that time, she was head of Microsoft uh, Comp and Ben in Europe, right? Yes, it's been a, it's been a long way, uh, but I can't believe I was so precautious because I was a two-year-old baby at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was robbing the cradle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've known each other for a long time, yes. It's always been a, a, a pleasure to, uh, to attend your events. 
Yeah, well, thank you. So I want to connect you with Paul Falcone, who's on the screen there. Paul, meet uh, Sandrine and please exchange messages. Sandrine, Paul is a longtime uh, HR, CHRO executive, and Sandrine is a comp and ben. She's now compensationinsider.com. Uh, oh. Paul? Good, Sandrine. It's a pleasure to meet a fellow HR person out there, especially doing it for Microsoft. Very impressive. Oh, Lovely thank you. you. A long time ago, I'm now um, an independent uh, consultant and uh, trainer and uh, um, board advisor. So, wonderful. Yes, Looking then. forward to connecting. Great. Yeah, that's yes. great. So, how long have you been in in Dubai and and Abu Dhabi? Oh my gosh, it's 15 years. Can you believe it? Like all the expats that go to Dubai, it was like two, three years maximum. This city is built on sand. It, we cannot put roots over there. And now you would have to kick me for me to leave it. So uh, <laughs> at least for now, <laughs> until they kick me out, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, so Matthias and Dave Levine, do you have an EAP uh, in um, a group in Dubai? Yes, they're, um, it's fairly active. It's such a unique community with 80% of the population or more being expats, uh, the employee population being expatriates. Um, and the mobility there is just, it's, it's so much more than, than most countries. Um, so yeah, uh, EAP sort of began years and years ago with a focus on expats. It's generalized to local nationals, but, um, there is, uh, one of the leading providers is called the American center. It's a little, it's a misnomer because it's definitely a UAE based, uh, provider uh, of behavioral health services, but they provide uh, good EAP services and there are others. And with uh, multinationals like uh, Emirates Airlines and others uh, being based there, it's also attracted more EAP activity. Okay, um, thanks very much. I want to make sure everybody knows Emily Braun. She uh, uh, has a business uh, specialty of international lifestyle consulting, which means she uh, helps people relocate, work from anywhere, right, Emily? Uh, yes, uh, to, to be exact, I'm uh, uh, helping uh, uh, American and Canadian professional baby boomers and uh, remote workers to find the best matching uh, country for their family for work and uh, retirement. And I'm not working with all over the world. It's impossible at this moment for me. I'm working with certain countries in Latin America, starting from Mexico down south and with south of uh, Europe, uh, with countries like Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, and Bulgaria. And why such variety? Because I am offering different lifestyle for the different type of people with different you know, desires, different budget, and different ideas. It's what I'm about. Thank you. That's, thank you very much. OK, I want to make sure Mark Colo knows Andrew Elliman, and everyone knows Mark Colo. Mark Colo uh, is now living in Utah, um, moved there, relocated his family uh, from Southern California uh, up to uh, where the national monuments are, right, Mark Colo? Yeah, I think there's a few. <laughs> there's a few over here, actually. There's quite a few over here. I haven't been to them all yet. I've been to a few of them, but I do miss Newport Coast. I love Orange County, Ed. It's been a hard time to shake that, but... Uh, we go back and visit as often as we can. Yeah. So Mark uh, is uh, a long time, well, he's not retired from doing it, household goods uh, in, in the U.S. primarily. And his specialty has been, over the years, um, has been relocating uh, movement of goods uh, for scientists world-renowned research scientists in the medical field uh, into um, UCI, University of California, Irvine is a major medical center um, and big time. Mark, why don't you talk a little bit about that? And I will. I let like me that. also just introduce Mark further. Thank you. For 14 years or so, he's had uh, the disease called Parkinson's, is is managing it. And, uh, but as you could tell, he's a 
<laughs> super bright guy and very, very energetic despite all of that. And he's a working example of recovery and going forward despite stress and um, handicap. Uh, he and others, uh, very prominent people in the community in Southern California, set up uh, an IRS approved charity called findneurohelp.org. And I've been honored to help PR the charity over the years. Mark and I have developed uh, medical TV talk shows in which we interview uh, famous people involved in research. I'm going to stop talking, Mark, take it from here. <laughs> well, Ed, uh, as, as many of you have heroes on this call, Ed's always been my hero. And uh, he's been a great example for me and a good friend. So I appreciate uh, his, his support. Um, I was first diagnosed about 16 years ago uh, in the year 2006. Uh, I hit me out of left field. I had no idea that I had Parkinson's. I went in and did some testing and I thought I was in the wrong room. Thought the doctor didn't know what he was doing. Thought he was a quack. And, uh, and, and all these tests came up to one conclusion. And that was that I had early onset Parkinson's. Now, at the time I was diagnosed, I had three children on the age of 10. I had a spouse, it was a very supportive spouse, and uh, I had a dog named Quincy, the largest cockapoo on the planet. Um, that was our family. Uh, and then later that year, I met with that specialist, and they said, Mark, I don't know how to cushion this at all, but I think your signs are early Parkinsonian symptoms. And no pressure, right? Yeah, I'm sure that was my first thought. What, how am I going to get through this? Yeah. So, but I've learned a lot. And nowadays, my mantra is kind of like adaptability proliferates possibilities. And when you have Parkinson's, you have all kinds of adaptations you have to learn, adjustments you have to make. It's not an easy road to go down, but it's, it's a very enlightening experience. I feel like I've had pockets of wisdom and inspiration that have come to me. I look at Chris and I think of Chris and what he's doing with the mattresses. I think that's awesome. That's admirable to me, Chris, that you would do that. And I really love great, I've come to love great mattresses. I mean, so you've got to find that rest somehow. But a little story about how I first got involved with this. I, I did relocation for about 40 plus years. During that time, I was probably in the top 5% of sales for my van line, my industry, for the work I did. So I kind of made my mark in that side of the business. Uh, but then toward the end of the, my career, uh, when I got uh, Parkinson's and when I started to try and adjust to the mental adjustments, I started shifting my focus. And I started focusing my, my, uh, my shifting my focus on uh, some of these world-renowned scientists that I was meeting as I would move these individuals from university to university. Most of them came from Ivy League colleges and were moving to the West Coast. But I met some amazing scientists that I, I, I could probably take a whole episode Ed talking about some of these scientists. But the first one I met was probably one of the most renowned and his name was Howard and I'll leave his, uh, his good name uh, off, off the, the, the discussion. But, Howard uh, was one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. His right-hand man who was on his, on his research team was a 25-year neurosurgeon in, in veteran. And I asked him one time on the site, how smart is Howard? And his name was Mass. Mass said, Howard, he didn't flinch. He said, Howard is the most brilliant man I've ever spoken to. And uh, that just really always impressed, impressed me about Howard. So a client called me purchasing, said, Mark, can you move laboratories? I said, yeah, I can move laboratories, no problem. And then he says, no, can you move laboratories? She asked me three times, can I move laboratories? And I said, I said, Diane, what are you worried about? She said, this guy is going to be my boss's boss, and if you mess it up, I'll lose my job. I said, oh, no pressure, Diane, no pressure, I'll take care of it. I hung up the phone, I, okay, I said, thank you. I called Howard and Howard was waiting for my call. I rarely have clients that would wait for my call. They want me to get me off the phone, get on with their day. This guy said, thank you. I was waiting for your call. And then I said, well, Howard, what is your biggest concern about your relocation? And he, he went quiet for a couple of seconds. He said, I'm, he said, I'm glad you asked me that question. He said, I have 13 cryogenic freezers with 40,000 brain samples of individuals who passed away with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. 
that's my life's work. Can't afford anything to happen to that and go wrong with it. And I said to Howard, I can more than fully understand that. I can't imagine the magnitude. I said, what else are you concerned about? He says, well, I'm glad you said that. If the temperature in these freezers increases or decreases by more than three degrees, it will compromise my samples. And I can't afford to have that happen. Can you guarantee me that won't happen, Mark? And I know our industry is fraught with some challenges and issues and, and, and you know, just the human factor alone can create some challenges and problems. So I thought, how am I going to deliver this thing? I'm very pleased to say that I somehow got through it all, got all of the specimens delivered. Not one single specimen was lost or damaged. And Howard and I have built such an amazing relationship ever since then. I probably, through Howard's relationship, have moved another 100 research scientists in various fields going to be the next Nobel Prize winner for some kind of a cure for something. So it's kind of cool to think about. I'm relocating people. I'm relocating their cure, the possible future cure as well. That's so really that. dynamite. That's really that, dynamite. Right? And I'm really happy to say that uh, Mark facilitated Howard and other world-renowned research scientists come on medical TV talk show and be our guests and tell their own story. And so we have all these shows uh, in a, uh, a group. And if somebody wants it, send me a message. I'll send them out to you. Um, and uh, these, these are real people speaking real English, <laughs> despite their otherworldly brains, um, including the doctor, Paula, Dr. Paula, who's head of the National Stem Cell Foundation, who was on our program and will be again. So we've got to bring in Andy Alleman. We've got to bring in Annette Dernick. Uh, so real quick, um, uh, Andy Alleman, you've heard this. Uh, he's not a competitor. He's retired now. But <laughs> but Andy Alleman also is in the household goods shipping business. Andy Alleman, thanks for being on our program again. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on again. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to see uh, some familiar faces and meet new faces as well when we do these. Um, Mark, I think it's fantastic. You know, I, I think what you do and what you've just said, that whole story, I, I think it's incredible. Um, Chris, um, uh, great to hear what you're doing in Ukraine. If there's anything I can do, uh, the company I work for, they have we have offices in the Ukraine, so we may be able to help you there as well. So we've got fully operational uh, offices there still. Um, so, so I'm sure we can do something there to, to help you as well. Um, yeah, it's just incredible to have all these people in, in the room at once. Um, I'm always amazed at how that's going to be. You know, um, I never see anyone as such as well, a competitor. I think we're all in this industry together. We need to work together. We need to operate together to make sure we provide a solution that's correct for the right people. Um, so, I, I, yeah, it's always a pleasure to be on your show, Edwin. Yeah, thank you. And so, Andy, um, do you have a warehouse in, in, in Kiev? Yes, we do, yeah. 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 So, Chris, do you need a warehouse? Um, we've actually got, uh, we're, we've already started rolling out our own distribution facilities and our light manufacturing facilities. Uh, but I would very much uh, like to chat with you, Andrew, offline because yeah. you know the, the need for logistics and, and movement within Ukraine is 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 not easy. Yeah. Getting things into Ukraine um, is not easy. One of the reasons we've had to one of the reasons we uh, bought the capacity of this mattress factory is we currently manufacture them in China, but they consume so much volume in containers that we couldn't bring them over. So for furniture rental, we have to have a, a continuous supply of mattresses. So we we were we developed that in Ukraine, so uh, yeah. And uh, our showroom in Kiev or Kiev will, will open up in, in uh, at the end of Q1. So we'd, we'd love to see where collaboration could take us. Yeah, no, we should definitely connect up. I've got quite a lot of connections out there for you as well. Um, I've got another friend um, who's out there. He, he's got a pizza company. Um, he's from Scotland. He took his oh, so well, first. Um, David Fox Pitt. Do you know him at all? Yeah, they're they're in Lviv. They're down on the on the Polish border, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the Sabon the Sabon Trust. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. he he was from from Scotland. He packed up everything. He's he's over there, um, and they are they are cooking pizzas 
for everyone who crosses the border. So everyone who comes across the border gets meat, work, met with a pizza. It doesn't sound a lot, but it's a huge amount to people that are needing someone with just a bit of food, et cetera, that comes through. So there's lots and, of things and, and on that, sorry, I mean, I mean that is something is as bizarre as trucks that distribute what I think like five, I think there are 5,000 pizzas now. You know, it, it, we, 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 we so often forget it's that one connection, just, just basically the connection of these, these people in Ukraine knowing that someone cares. And whether it's through pizza or through cotton or whatever it is, um, it really, the multiplier effect uh, of those things is, is, is off the charts. Yeah. Fascinating. So Annette Dernick, you're all about love and peace and engagement, right? Love and peace and companies. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> I always love how you bring together people with, let's say, different needs and different aspects, but who can collaborate. So that's really something that I really appreciate a lot. And um, yeah, when, while listening, um, I have to say that I've been working for relocation companies as well, because um, I'm um, very fond of intercultural awareness. And um, I also supported many students before going abroad and also employees before going to another country. And um, the other thing, and that's um, the main reason why my company now is called Love and Peace and Companies is um, that only very late I realized that some traumatic experience from my parents during World War II influenced my life considerably. I didn't know that before, only after let's say some, some special event um, or something special occurred in my life. And now that I'm, I know for sure that I really want to work for peace because we can't fight for peace. It's only um, that we can change our own attitude and it all starts with me and um, with my behavior. And um, I think um, in my opinion, it's not always necessary to look across borders, but as I can start with me, um, I also look into companies and the companies I've been working in or with sometimes had an atmosphere that wasn't that peaceful or appreciating. So I really concentrate on working with these companies um, as much as I can, because I think that every work of peace that we do is a contribution to the peace of our whole planet. Paul Falcon, th this sounds like a love fest, doesn't it? I'm liking everything that I'm hearing. And that, that's wonderful. The work, the work that everyone does on this call, Ed, is just incredible. Yeah, unique. So how do you like being an entrepreneur? Well, so everyone knows after three decades of doing human resources, about six <laughs> months ago, I opened my own consulting firm. And I was scared to death, but Ed, I'm loving it. It's been six months and I am a happy camper. I'm glad I made this move. So the Sherm new board was just announced. Uh, it's really diverse, isn't it? It is. It is good for them. Yeah, I look forward to being at that next national convention. Uh, we've been- yeah, I'll be there too. I'm doing a presentation, so I'll see you there. Good, yeah. Well, you know, they give me a press pass to do broadcasts and interview some of the board and some of the key speakers. So please uh, come back on Global TV Talk Show. Of course, anytime. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so Matthias, uh, when we do our meeting in Hamburg, um, I'm looking at uh, May 15 afternoon luncheon. Uh, I'd like you to, of course, you'd be involved, but if you could advise me about others I should uh, invite to come and be a speaker, whether it's virtual or in person in the Hamburg event, uh, I would love that. Why don't you tell me uh, more about your organization? Yeah. Um, what we do at the EAEF, I start first of all with the EAEF, is the same like we are all doing here right now. I think in the EAEF, we can say we are colleagues. Some of us are also uh, competitors together in a country or an area, but nearly everybody is friends with each other. It's an unbelievable um, um, forum, and I would really invite every one of you to get there to join. Maybe during our next conference in Luxembourg, it's from the 9th to 10th 
June in Luxembourg. It's a really pleasure. We had a lot of fun there and we do also good business. So um, that's what we are doing with the EAF. We support each other uh, and we try to bring up the EA um, in general. Right. Me, myself, I do uh, mostly counseling. I got a little network of counselors and we do mostly counseling for EAP providers in uh, Germany, Austria and Switzerland, mostly in German, but sometimes also in English. And that's what I do next to adult learning. I like to give workshop. Uh, I like to also like, I think, Paul, you, you do the same, like giving workshops and webinars to leaders also. Yeah, well, Sandrine Bardot does that too. So, so Sandrine, tell us about what your your work life is all about as um, entrepreneur in compensation. So, when I set up my my company uh, ten years ago, I'm going to celebrate uh, ten years uh, early April. Um, I was the first, as far as I know, I was the first independent uh, consultant in my field uh, ten years ago and uh, based in the in the region so i had to educate the market that it was possible to work with a small consultant rather than going to the huge consultancies uh, that has 14 15 20000 uh, consultants across the globe uh, and i'm i'm glad that uh, i think that i was lucky i was the first one to do it but um just as a, a, a kind of a a little bit in advance compared to what the market is moving, but there are more and more people who are now uh, becoming freelancers or setting up their own company uh, in that field. What I do, uh, because I'm also, as far as I know, I'm the person in the region who has the most uh, number of years of experience in that field. Uh, so I can focus on things that are a little bit more at the strategic level which is why I'm working with boards and the uh, uh, heads of HR and the heads of uh, Total Rewards internationally. Uh, mostly what I do, um, I do uh, so board advisory, so I'm a board member, um, but I, I also do classic consulting. So I help companies understand how they are paying in their different industries and their different countries and uh, the areas where uh, they can improve uh, uh, things. And that covers uh, all the cash elements of the package, the benefits, uh, the performance management, the well-being. That's why the EAPs are uh, interesting uh, for me. This is kind of the additional services uh, that the companies can provide uh, to differentiate themselves. And uh, the other thing that I do is training. So um, I, I am faculty for World at Work, which is the global um, uh, association of compensation and benefits uh, professionals. But I'm also uh, designing and uh, delivering my own uh, courses uh, in Asia mostly and uh, the Middle East and Europe. I don't do courses in the US because the US market is uh, very unique uh, because you have all those uh, 401ks and uh, healthcare things and so on. So it's very unique, but for the rest of the world, I can uh, I can cover. So I kind of mix my time between uh, all of those. Yeah, I want you to be sure and connect uh, in the chat with uh, Gary Sanger uh, okay. and, and also Teneke. Um, and Andy, do you have uh, AGS in, in the Gulf States? We do, yes. So uh, yeah. we're, we're, in, um, we're in Dubai, Qatar. Okay. Um, so we can assist out in those areas. So happy to connect with you okay. guys out there as well. Um, right. So yes, so you, you probably know, you've probably seen us, you probably know us out there, <laughs> I, I would have thought. So, yeah. uh, so in Dubai, um, are there, uh, well, I know you have Russians there who uh, escaped to, yes. uh, uh, okay, but you also have people who are from England and from all over the world coming to live there. Yes. Um, yes. So meet Emily Braun. She's an international lifestyle consultant. Uh, so Emily, do you do anything in Dubai area? No, not at this point. It doesn't mean that I would not uh, consider it soon because uh, at this point I'm solopreneur. So I'm concentrating on Latin America and European market. 
But since people are moving and moving quickly over the last years and would be moving, and I'm working with remote workers and professionals, actually. So obviously, I'm always tuned on what's happening in this part of the world. I'm connected with Bali because it's a center of attention. And I'm always open for collaboration, I would say. Yeah. I'd, I'd just like to come in and just say Please. what a great, uh, a great location to buy is. Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, it's, it's gone from strength to strength. Um, huge Russian community there. As you say, a lot, a lot of Russians have got out. And some of my colleagues are in that situation as well. Um, so a, a, a great hub, a great place to be in the UAE. Just wanted to add that in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah speaking bet. about Russian speaking community, <laughs> I, I can obviously connect and I'm actually helping uh, for some Russians who now in hard condition um, to to kind of escape to find um, you know location in Latin America and North America. So there is uh, interesting points. Yeah, yeah, it's yes. lovely. It's a lovely place to be, especially in the winter. Right now, the weather is like fantastic. Uh, in the summer, <laughs> well, <laughs> you have to learn to live in in the mall, and uh, because it's forty. Uh, four officially 44 Celsius degrees. That's the official temperature. Uh, the real temperature is more like 48 to 51. Um, so, <laughs> but there are legal considerations at 44 degrees. So rarely does the official temperature go, go above. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it's a lovely place to be. Lots of opportunities, lots of opportunities. Definitely. Thank you very much. I want to uh, ask Chris to tell us about uh, how you are being protected, safety. Well, I, I, I've got 12 new friends here, so I think that, <laughs> that's a long way, doesn't it? <laughs> I, um, I, I, of course, I meant in, in Ukraine. But Ed, as, as you know, uh, the other people know, and I, I mean, I have extensive experience with this uh, in the reconstruction uh, with Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Libya. Uh, Homo Essentials uh, was involved there. And so, you know, this isn't some type of uh, foolhardy venture of what we want to do. Um, you know, it's it's been born out of our experiences in other post-conflict areas. This one's considerably different. And the, the missiles that are just kind of flying all over the country inject uh, another element of uncertainty that's unwelcome. But, um, but in a small town of Kremenets, 20,000 people, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's not dangerous. Um, everybody knows where, the most dangerous thing is everybody knows where you live. Uh, but the, you know, when I'm in Kiev, um, you know, it, the, what's very different about this is the success that the Ukrainians have had in shooting down and stopping uh, the inbound missiles. The, from my experiences in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the destruction should probably be 100 to 200 times greater than it is. So the Western and industrialized nations that have come to support Ukraine have provided critical uh, armaments and uh, weapons to help protect uh, Kyiv and, and many of the other cities. This, this attack on the infrastructure and the electricity grid, um, you know, is, a, is, a, is, as I said earlier, a horrible element. Uh, but there's not, you know, th what, what's different about this is, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, contractors such as myself were looked upon as uh, abating or uh, helping invaders and occupying forces. Here, we're going in with the full support of the indigenous Ukrainian people, those that just want jobs, those that just want peace for their family. And that's what I said at the beginning. You know, it'd, it'd be fun uh, uh, to go in there and, and deliver some mattresses and then Ed, you know this, I, I can go back to, um, you know, where I live in Hong Kong, I can sit on the roof, of probably one of the greatest streets on, on planet Earth and talk to friends over at Gentonic and say, these are the photos. So I, you know, at this stage in my life, you know, if you have a chance to make a difference, it's a chance I have to take. And I've got the full support of my family to do it. And this is something I very much want to do. So I'm, I'm in with this small community, uh, but I'm also involved, as you know, in the reconstruction conferences and uh, you know, economic forums. So you, you have kind of this dynamic life of being in small town Ukraine, but yet being involved with 
you know, the European Union and the, and the State Department and other people like that, you know, uh, working on it. So it's been it's been fantastic. To, 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 Ukraine is dangerous. I'm not taking away from that. And, and there are things that are horrific, especially with the loss of power, loss of water. You know, have my, me having to use snow uh, to wash my hands. But uh, the fact that there was two feet of snow kept the vodka very cold. Um, nothing better than ice cold vodka from your balcony um, when the refrigerator doesn't work. So you just have to be careful. But I, I, I think that, you know, it, and again, I can't speak for anybody else's safety. I have not felt that dangerous, even when I was in Kiev, when the missiles were falling. Um, you know, I, I think it's not as dangerous as, as everybody says, but it's an assessment that each and every one of uh, those individuals and their families and companies must make. So reconstruction, there's a video that uh, the government of Ukraine uh, has produced a very high tech video. It's on our website. And if anybody wants to uh, get it, I'll, you know, I'll send it around uh, after the show's over. And each of you will get a copy of the show to do with whatever you want with it. We're going to host sponsor it on globalbusinessnews.net and globaltvtalkshow.com, our YouTube channel and uh, Facebook group. Our LinkedIn connections are 4.2 million if we reach them all. Um, more, more likely it'll be 400,000 to 500,000 across six months. Um, so a lot of people will be seeing this program. We will be doing another mastermind type show, uh, the same format. Uh, you're all invited to come back uh, about one month from now. Uh, I'll post the exact date, I don't know yet about a month from now. And then again in March, uh, we want to keep it global business talent, masterminds, you know, glorious name. That means that all of you are on the show because I thought you were experts in what you do. And if we could come together, hey, we have a party. Gary Sanger, I know you're um, in a hard close. We're awaiting the arrival of Michael Piker who's uh, been in a, another conference all day. He's in uh, outside of London. Um, he's with Flutter Entertainment, uh, which is a global company based in, uh, I think, London. Uh, they own uh, many, many bars and restaurants and movie studios and TV stations. And uh, FanDuel is the sports betting thing, uh, which is giant in the US. Uh, and he's um, in the uh, suite, the uh, talent suite, uh, and he's directly in charge of mobility, talent mobility, but also uh, rewards, anything to do with Comp and Ben, and anything to do with DE&I. So he's going to be talking about that uh, when he gets on the show here um, sometime in the next 20 minutes, I hope. So uh, until then... Uh, we're going to continue. So, so Tineke, um, if you could address, if you don't mind, the, the your view, you touched on it earlier, uh, the masculine way, the feminine way. Okay. Um, well, the how how I got got involved in this is because when I sold my business after being in business for twenty two years and only had been supported by men. Um, I started talking to women in business because I thought, hey, let's let's go and connect with with some more women. To me, at the time, they were aliens. It was a they talked about their feeling. They talked about uh, um, they didn't feel me. They didn't resonate with me. And I was all like, like you know, I'm 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 open. I'm communicative. What's 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 happening here? Um, and slowly, slowly, over the years, this, this is 10 years of personal development of me ha having to notice that I was a very masculine woman, uh, entering the feminine, more feminine arena, more feminine way of uh, operating, doing business. And I don't say I'm still there, but one of the things for me is, for example, developing my intuition, uh, doing meditation, uh, listening to my voice when it tells me something crazy to do, which in my mind does totally not make any sense. 
and my, my mind wants to control, my mind wants to uh, dictate what's going to happen. Uh, but the feminine is all about listening to your intuition, following the flow, uh, experience doesn't matter, trusting. Um, so that is at some point, I, I started working with women because I thought they need to have focus, they need to have goals, they need to create plans, they need to have financial knowledge. Yes, they do. And um, I had to learn to become more feminine. So it, it was beautiful how it played out. Um, so what, what I now see is, uh, and, and I've learned this the past years, it is for the feminine woman, it's very difficult to run a business um, because uh, the business arena can still be pretty masculine. Um, and I'm talking about uh, entrepreneurship. Um, in my country, 30% of the women start a business. They choose to uh, remain small. Uh, most of them are self-employed. So the real big businesses often are owned by men. And then I started wondering, why is this the case? Why do women keep their businesses so small? Why do men build bigger businesses? Well, for charters, for starters, they love challenges. Uh, I used to do that too. Um, they have a lot of guts. They like to take, they, they are more into risk taking than women are. So it's, it's all from my personal experience. And uh, I sometimes get judged by that, that I'm too black and white, but it helps stating things clear. There are huge, huge differences in how women operate when they run a business and how men, the, the masculine man uh, operates his business. Because, you know, we all are masculine and we all are feminine, but naturally men are born more masculine and naturally women are born more feminine. And um, for me, it helps when women start to see and understand that you, you need to be out there. You need to promote yourself. You need to be bold. All those things are also important. And then, yes, collaboration is hugely important. And, and I see this here already happening so beautifully. Um, listening to your intuition, um, making an impact, creating a difference. All of those things are feminine traits. Those, and so when you look up the definition of success in the dictionary, uh, it is still about numbers, about power, about uh, status. Uh, it's not about creating a difference. It's not about making impact. Um, and, and we would say those are the soft skills, but it's not soft. Uh, it's a lot of hard work to get there as well. But if you do that the feminine way, listening to your intuition, gu being guided by the flow, it's not hard work anymore. It's so much easier because you skip a lot of pain, trial and error. And that is what I really want to help women, but also men with that it's so much easier. It, it's not always, you know, just do it. It might not be the right time and the right moment for you. But if your senses say that, why force the wall and break through it? Wait, wait until it is the right moment. So, I mean, I can go on, Ed, as you can hear. Brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, you... Uh try to first of all you learn how to swim and and then you say well i'm going to swim in the english channel now that's not a feminine trait <laughs> that, that is, that's like a suicide I, I, no, that's I, a suicide I, trait but <laughs> i have to say i have to say no so so um I, I think you're slightly wrong there because because i the channel swimming i knew nothing about swimming at the age of 48 i couldn't swim I'd done my Everest things. I'd got that all out of my system. I got a world record for the highest dinner party on Everest. Um, and, and I got all that out of my system. And then my wife said to me, do something at sea level because you, you, you literally <laughs> doing all this high altitude stuff has nearly killed you so many times. I was caught in an earthquake in 2015 while I was trying to summit Everest the first time. So I had all that and I put that all away. And, um, I looked at what else I could do. And when she said do something at the sea level, at the age of 48, my biggest fear, and I love taking on fear, and I try to, I do talks on fear and what is really fear. And, and the whole thing about swimming the channel was, well, my biggest fear was water, not swimming the channel. My biggest fear was water, being out of depth, not being able to swim. 
And I thought, right, OK, what can I do? So I announced to the world that I was going to swim the English Channel. And um, of course, everyone fell down who knew me saying, well, how is that possible? You can't even swim and you're petrified of water. And I looked at it logically and said, well, one, I need to learn to swim. Two, I need to get fit enough. And three, I need to train. And if I can do all of those, I'll overcome what I'm doing. Now, because I set myself a challenge, I put the fear out of the way because the challenge took over the fear element. So you start to learn much quicker. And, and I learned a lot. I mean, I was supposed to do it in two years, but we had a pandemic, all the pools shut. So I ended up swimming up a river every day. Um, it was horrific. I mean, and, and then, then I spent 16 weekends down at Dover Harbour, swimming in the harbour. The, the big thing I would say then, going back to your point a second ago, um, it was a very feminine thing. And the reason I say that is because more women attempt the channel than men by far. When I was on the beach, there must have been made, there must have been about 50 people training to do the channel. I would say it's probably about 10 guys and the rest were women. Phenomenal women that swim the channel. So I, I, I it's, it's funny how we straight away think, oh, it's a man's thing. I think the, the stats, if we look at it, I bet more women have swum the channel than men. They're so much better at swimming as well, I must say. But it, it was something I learned from, from that whole experience. And yeah, and I got to do it, um, I got to do it in 2020, um, and, or 2021? I can't remember now, 2020, yeah, 2021, sorry, because we're in 23 now. Um, and I did it in September. I managed to get 11 miles um, and then I just couldn't do it no more. But it was still the best thing I've ever done. It, it topped Everest, if I'm honest. It was the most, I had a lot of reasons for doing it. Um, when I first took on the swim, when I first came back from Everest after breaking the world record in 2018, uh, I got back, we was in the papers, we were in the Times, everything. And, uh, and then I found out my mum had cancer and she was dying. And, and my last conversation with my mum in the hospice was, uh, I'm thinking of learning to swim, to swim the channel. And she just said, do it son, life's too short. That's what triggered me to do it. And then when I, the day came after three years later, me standing on the beach and stepping into the water to swim for forever, I sort of knew I was never going to make France and, and I and I swam as long as I could and as strong as I could and five hours into the swim I you know jellyfish I'd swum over the jellyfish I was swimming next to the big boats that you see the ferries going past absolutely incredible day slightly rough in the morning um, it settled out and and then I just heard this voice I was getting tired my arms were getting tired and I heard this voice and it was my mum and she just said you can give up now son you've proved what you wanted to do. And I just stopped. And I know people say, well, why did you stop? I just stopped because for me, it was my whole, I don't know, you could call it grief. You could call it, you know, the brain playing with you to say, you know, using whatever it could to get me out of the water. But it was the most fantastic day ever that I've had. And it was really enlightening to what I did. So yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm probably talking too much. <laughs> no, no, this is really good exposure. Um, so, Gary, uh, do you think you can find an executive job for Andrew Elliman? <laughs> Especially if they're afraid of water, right? That's, uh, <laughs> I want to go back to Tinicky's uh, comment. And I'll turn your organizational chart upside down. And do you, do you, your clients, your companies, do any of you have all male customers? I guess not. And so if you're trying to get that voice, that intuition, that rationale about the female side of your customers, what do they want? You know, I, uh, I think the good old boys better wake up. You know, we still find way too many of those in companies and those that have moved forward, the balance of their execs, you know, the balance of the voice of what kind of services, what kind of products you know, I'm reminded, I'm an executive search guy. I'm a retained headhunter. And we work for companies to fill out their senior management and executive teams. A recent success, two billion plus in revenue, privately held company, third generation, um, global. Oh, this company has their CFO that's ready to retire in the next year or two. 
we were fortunate enough to get the search. This lady started yesterday and she's in the queue to be the backup for the CFO for this big privately held company. I can assure you this company has a balance on what their services are through the lens of a woman or the lens of a man. And so as I think about how you deliver, what you deliver, you know, let's keep in mind, what does our customer want? Because in the age old uh, adage, if you're not serving that customer, somebody else is. And I think having that perspective is a big, big deal. And so I really commend you, Tineke, as to, uh, you know, helping that woman balance out, get the full perspective, you know, and uh, if your organization is properly focused, I'm located here in Los Angeles. We do global work, but if they're properly focused, you're going to know the lens of that customer and what they're looking for. I, uh, I really commend where you are Thank as you. it Thank relates you. to women trying to Thank grow their much. business. And uh, God forbid, you might take on all the uh, attributes of what a man has, or God forbid, you might take them all that what a woman has. You know, let's run the business. <laughs> through the lens of making it super great for that customer. Emily Braun, you're an entrepreneur. Say something about all this. You know, I'm not only entrepreneur and uh, woman, solopreneur in my business now. I have different upbringing and a different perspective. Um, I was born in Soviet Union, as you can uh, realize probably. And I still don't understand all this hype about men, women, equity, equality. Like I get it uh, in my school and I grew over. Uh, so for me, it does not important man or woman. It's a merit. It's what this person about. I'm not dividing my entities uh, to, to women, feminine or masculine sides. First of all, I have engineering degree. The secondly, I learned biology. I was a good student, actually. And I'm not buying this, um, you know, latest uh, discovery, scientific discovery. We are all complicated creatures, men and women, and we have different facilities in us. And when I'm doing something um, as an entrepreneur or I'm trying to plan something, I'm not considering myself like I'm woman or not. Like, you know, I'm not open or aggressive uh, feminist, I would say. I don't want to diminish anyone. It, it's my view. I I'm really don't understand sometimes what you're speaking about. There is a, a educated um, entrepreneurs, people, women or men. <laughs> I am against the ratio. It should be, you know, this percentage or other percentage. If she is really smart, educated, has all qualities, kudos, 100%. But if not, what we are speaking about, it's how I look at this. And, you know, the Soviet Union, I, I learned that it's all propaganda, but you guys still kind of going through this. There's my perspective. Thank you. Okay, everybody, here's Michael Piker. Thank you for joining us, Michael. I want to introduce you to uh, several people here. Uh, Paul Falcone, uh, many years has been uh, CHRO, Nickelodeon, Paramount Pictures, Viacom. Um, I've already introduced you, Michael, earlier as uh, being in, in charge of rewards and people, talent, DE&I for Flutter. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, My boss came in the room. I'm delayed. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's quite all right. Want you to meet Christopher X-Line, um, Michael Piker. Chris is our guy uh, who's going to be in Ukraine uh, tomorrow, is it, Chris? Uh, Krakow tomorrow, uh, back in Ukraine on Friday. So he's, uh, Michael, Chris is a CEO of a multinational company called Home Essentials that's based in Hong Kong, but his office is uh, in many places. Um, home furnishings uh, for relocated people and, and others. And he's going into Ukraine under the, his banner of Rest Assured Ukraine. 
He's bought out a factory capacity, manufacturing capacity to manufacture his mattresses in Ukraine and give them out to people who need them. Chris? Uh, Michael, it's wonderful to finally meet you. I've heard about you for a long time, so it's good to put a face with the name. Thank you, and that's a very noble, uh, that's a great pursuit you're pursuing. That's amazing. Well, we're, 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 we're there. I mean, there's a business element to it because we need to uh, start laying all the groundwork for uh, participating with the reconstruction of Ukraine when victory is secure. Uh, but uh, and we, and we want to get all that uh, operated now. And I'm looking forward to getting back. And as everyone else knows, I actually moved there from Hong Kong uh, to become a resident in a small town called Kremenitz. Um, and, you know, Emily, thank you for all of your uh, guidance and assistance with that. Emily's been fantastic of, of trying to get people to connect. And, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, I've got people waiting for me for other meetings since I'm leaving tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, what, it, Ed, again, you know, this brings back all the great memories of the Ed Cohen conferences. Um, I can't wait for them to start up again. I look forward to potentially meeting all of you in, in person. Uh, and you're all welcome to come and join us in uh, uh, Kiev or Kremenitz, and uh, we'll give you some of the best borscht you've ever had in your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. So, Michael, what's it like to work for a big company in the entertainment gambling business? Uh, well, it's uh, you probably know our brands in America, for example, FanDuel, which is quite famous. Uh, so yes, frenetic World Cup, lots of things. Um, you can imagine wearing a reward and DI hat. You've got, for example, in Doha with the World Cup, you know, we have staking betting on a particular uh, big, uh, huge event. But on the other hand, you've got to also weigh that against very sensitively some of the human rights issues. So uh, it's a it's an interesting balance between commercial uh, intent versus um, the DNI uh, balancing, how you definitely do that well, is something that's always at the top of my mind. But the sector is growing. You know, I came from the tobacco sector, which people have strong views on, <laughs> into betting and gambling. So uh, uh, interesting to be in these sectors where people clearly have, rightly, some strong views. So also from the entertainment business, as I said earlier, um, uh, Paul Falcone. Uh, is now an uh, you know, entrepreneur, but for many years, as I mentioned, Viacom, Paramount Pictures, uh, Nickelodeon, uh, much the same uh, uh, sensitivity is needed in the people leadership, people coaching role. Right, Paul? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, you can't be in the entertainment business without, you know, being something controversial at some point. And, and you know, there are pretty strong feelings out there these days and people are not afraid to let their feelings be known. So Michael, I, I, I empathize with you. I understand where you're coming from. So earlier today, you did a post uh, and uh, uh, about uh, DE and I and rewards in this environment that we're in now. Did you want to talk about what yeah. uh, you were doing uh, well, earlier today? There's quite a bit of confluence. Um, most people look at me skeptically, either do a reward or DNI separately when I go to events. And they say, well, why is it together? Because it is coming together. So let me try to be specific. So, first is with regard to um, uh, solid transparency, gender pay gap reporting, pay equity. There's actually a lot of overlap. But more importantly, is um, the manifestation of the way we express reward more inclusively. Um, so I find it very appealing and also I have a personal narrative because I'm, you know, I'm out, I went around the world. So it's, it's a very personal thing to me. So reward, I always say is, uh, what I am, d is who I am as a human being. And so reward can be quite Socratic, quite numeric and quite amorphous sometimes. And we're, as I said today, we're stuck in the past. We kind of in this Sandrine knows. Reward does its thing, but we've been talking about the same issues for 30 years. When you put a DNI lens on top of reward, it actually suddenly then requires reward to step up and step differently. So that's kind of the ethos of what I was trying to say today is that we're stuck in the past, we need to change. And DNI is a beautiful expression about this particular facet where you can uh, join the two together and do it better. Sandrine, would you like to comment? Um, I. I... I, I'm on a similar, I think, uh, thinking journey than, uh, than Mike. 
in being in that space for many years, um, I still see some practices that uh, were already outdated when I started my career 30 years ago. Um, but um, today, I think that a number of reward professionals are trying to, to change. Uh, the other thing also, which, uh, which is kind of similar, but at the company uh, level or at the corporate level is the ESG. So all these corporate governance and, uh, and so on, uh, which is also getting more and more uh, impacting in terms of, uh, of rewards. And I would say that ESG is kind of the DEI of the, of the corporation uh, in, in some ways. The, um, it's the, the more, uh, I'll say soft, because that's not really what it is, but the, the human uh, kind of aspect uh, to it. And uh, that's what's pushing us to, to change as well. So I agree with what uh, Mike was saying. I agree. Paul Falcone. Yeah, I'm, I agree with everyone too. The funny thing about this whole idea of diversity and inclusion is just practical. Gary Sanger mentioned a few minutes ago that you know you want your business leaders to reflect your customer base. But besides that, everybody, talent scarcity is going to be the driver for the rest of the century. It's not just because of COVID. Um, when you look at all the differences that are happening demographically and labor replacement rates and everything else, the strat going through the 2050s and the 2080s, we're going to be recruiting talent acquisition, growing your own talent, that's really going to be the biggest challenge. You need to be able to access all talent within your nation. You can't just look at it as female. It's got uh, male. It's got to be female and male just to stay alive. So this will fix itself. I just think we need to get there faster. We need to push the river a little bit. I'd like to hear from, and I know you all would like to hear from on this regard, EAP, employee assistance, um, Dave and and Matthias, uh, would you like to sum up and talk about DE&I and rewards, how it fits in with the EAP? Dave? I'm happy to go. Um, you know, we look to our social institutions, our traditional social institutions of church and family and government and education and economics or work. But um, more and more, we're, we are looking to work to solve to, to address some of these social issues that we're talking about. DNI is an important one. Um, and as as James brought up to start off the call, you know things have changed a lot. And one of those things is there's just more emphasis on that social institution of work um, to um, to address stress, to uh, to address emotional behavioral health um, from an economic perspective. From a work and cost benefit perspective, not just in peace uh, orientation, but I think that's where the solution lies. Um, there's just so much divisiveness, as everyone knows on this call, that interferes with people's behavioral health and, and health overall, well being. Um, and uh, as fast as things move, I think it, it's complicated further by social media and the internet. and the dogs we're listening to, the, the, the dog on our right shoulder and the dog on the shoulder, and what do we pay attention to is the, the one we feed, the one we listen to. So are we listening to MSNBC or Fox News or CNN, or um, do we even get our news from the New York Times or Washington Post or uh, other social, other traditional outlets? So we, we, and I think this stirs up the whole divisiveness, accelerates the whole divisiveness, and to an extent becomes addicting. Um, and it's important, and we see this right and left. Uh, it's it's not just the January sixth uh, revolt in uh, uh, in the U.S. and the attempted takeover and coup of the Capitol and the insurrection, but uh, and I'll hand it to Matthias. It's the, uh, the the attempted coup just a month ago in Germany, uh, or the the right and left uh, divisiveness we see in Brazil in the recent elections in Brazil and everything that follows. And people look to work as an institution to help people address this and make sense of some of these conflicts, DNI included. Matthias, uh, am I overemphasizing this divisiveness? <laughs> no, I just totally agree. And I think also, it's also about a community at the workplace. 
to get people together, to have an, the same mind, the same goal, maybe, uh, um, yeah, in a way um, to achieve the same goal and to stay together. And that's what I think where um, EA programs could be really helpful for. But I totally agree, Dave. No, I think we should all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. So Annette, mm -hmm. would, would you like to lead us in that song? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I really, um, I really agree that that's what it really is about. If I am looking for talents for my company, then the best way to do so is that my employees are satisfied with their job, with my company, and that they tell the kind of neighbors and friends um, about the, the great work they are doing in, in this company. And also as clients, we love to buy from those companies. And so it's not only about, let's say, uh, let's call it a soft factor like peace, but it's also about money because if employees really stay in the companies and if they are satisfied, they are not um, ill so many days, they stay longer in the company. Um, if the clients are happy as well, and this all contributes to uh, an increased turnover. So it's not only about, let's say, being nice, but as I've been studying um, econo economics many, many years ago, so I, I, always, I also am wearing the glasses of um, um, somebody um, thinking in an economic way. And so in my opinion, it's, it's both. It's, it's good for, the, for, for, the, for, for my inner being and for my, my feeling to feel um, kind of um, being supported in the company. And it also contrib contributes to the, to the result of the company. So that was not yet come by, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Andy Elliman, um, let's change this topic just a little bit to look at Outlook for 23 business. What do you see happening there? Are, uh, so far, are companies sending people, are they? Yeah, we've, we've, seen, we've seen a huge increase in people starting to move people again um, after there was lots of rumours that won't happen. Um, obviously, the remote workers are still there. Um, uh, people want more choice. So we've, we're seeing a lot of that. So we've adapted as a company as well. But but we're seeing a lot of tenders at the moment. So it's a good sign for us that a lot of companies are now starting to get back into the thought process of, OK, we need to move our staff. We need to um think about what we're going to do for the next two three years so so it's an interesting um it, it's getting going again if that makes sense it, it took for forever after the pandemic for it to actually happen but we've seen a huge increase in the amount of movement um i, I think last year uh we ended up with 138,000 families that we relocated and moved around the world so so it's showing that that's a huge increase from like the years before um, which were obvious there was no, you know, you couldn't move across borders, but, um, but yeah, it, but we're seeing a huge increase this year is looking good. I think this, I think 2023 is going to be a good year overall for everyone, for all businesses. I, I, I love, um, I think just going back to what they were talking about, Dean D and I, um, I think this is the most fascinating thing that's happened for a long time. For me, it's all about finding the right person who's right for the job. And, you should strip away whether they're male, female, whatever gender, whatever color, whatever race, whatever who they are, um, disability even. Like if they're the right person for that job, that's where DE &E and I is bringing them people to the top. And it's just lovely to hear companies talking about it all the time, like rather than just the odd company talking about it. It's, it's every company I talk to now, it's at the top of their list. And it was very interesting what you just said, Mike, about reward now being part of that or sitting on top of reward i find that fascinating because i haven't heard many people talk about that at the moment so yeah i'd love to get your thoughts on that later actually um but i find it fascinating i, th I think it's 2023 i think it's going to be a good year for everyone um I, I think you know everyone's working in the right way everyone's starting to think differently um and people are, are wanting different options assignees want different options we want different options and i, and I think that's that's a good thing um, I'm a huge, I'm a huge believer in change, um, and I think um, this we're in a, an era now where people want change. They've always wanted change, but now people are, are not afraid to stand up and say, "No, I, I don't agree with that." Right? I think this is what we should do. So yes, there's huge things happening in the world. I think at the moment. 
So, Michael, uh, in your company and in, in the all the companies, the organization is—is is it true that the people have the liberty to stand up and discuss things? Um, is that is that the people feeling within your company? Yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate to work in seven iconic brands. Um, so other firms, Cisco, for example, and Novo are very advanced. But yes, yeah, so the voice of the employee to speak up, uh, particularly there's lenses, uh, for example, in our uh, area around gender. So pay progression, retention, and promotion to the very top echelon for women is equal to men, which is absolutely what must happen. Um, two is that we acknowledge accessibility challenges of the workforce and multicultural uh, representation is equally important. And being gay myself, so LGBTQIA+, the representation of my community, for example, in all the companies I've been in has been very resolute. Um, so the vo we call it every voice matters. So we find when leaders disclose their personal narrative with true disclosure and empathy. And, and if they're truly authentic, then the voices then escalate, the voices are then acknowledged. Um, so I, you know, I've been in the field for a while and is we, I see some amazing practices at Starbucks, for example, or at, uh, for example, I've seen at McDonald's, I've seen at Coca-Cola, it used to be clients of mine at Mercer. Um, and they use analytics to drive evidence so every single thing that we intend to do, we measure it and we use predictive analytics to then generate outcome. So in our case, we say 40% of women to, uh, by 2026 to be running the company. We're already there at 33.8. Um, so metrics matter, evidence matters, data matters as much as the voice, but also if you can measure it. Thank you very much. James Moss, you've built, as I said earlier, um, mobility tech into absolutereload.com. Um, so people can run their own relocation without spending a fortune. Yeah, well, people and companies. I mean, it, it, this has been a really fascinating uh, discussion, actually, and picking up on uh, Andrew's points about thinking differently, I thought was great. And, uh, and Michael on, on the empathy and so on. I mean, there, there is change, but there are a lot of headwinds also out there. I mean, so, I, mean I don't want to be, sort of be the guy who throws a, a bucket of out water over this, but you know, there's a lot of talk of recession. There's extremely high inflation, which uh, governments and everyone's trying to get under control. You've got the headwinds uh, clearly of the, the Ukrainian uh, tragedy that's taking place. Um, and, you know, I, I deal with communication, I deal with the way that people move and the way they work and the way they're changing. And I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, I think there's a, a, a number of sort of new ways of doing things, the old things better and differently. Um, I thought Chris was great uh, saying that you, you, you know, give the, the customer what they want, not what they think they need necessarily, but what they, what they, what they want to actually want. Um, but there is, like, there's a little anecdote cross-reference across that, uh, which is one of my favorite business quotes, which is Henry Ford. And when Henry Ford was doing his research, you know, as to, you know, what, what does the customer want, uh, they all came back with the same answer. They wanted a faster horse. Uh, and I think there, there's, there's a lot in that. Uh, not everyone realizes quite what a faster horse looks like. Um, I'm certainly seeing that in my world. Uh, you know, we do remote relocation, pay as you go, it's never been done before. Uh, we give a 100% money back guarantee, which has never been done before. Um, and we save companies a small fortune, uh, not doing all their relocation, but just, you know, for the, you know, the bits where you don't really want to spend a fortune. And, um, you know, we, we're sort of having a bit of a Henry Ford moment. Um, you know, we're in that space. It's going to be really interesting, you know, Andrew, uh, in, in your world, the shipping world, the relocation world, uh, the way people get employed, you know, interns and so on, are you going to, you know, give them red carpet treatment from day one or are you going to do other things? So uh, great discussion, a lot going on. 
a lot going on. I think it's going to be a, a fascinating year. Thank you all. Paul Falcone, I thank you for your time. It's so valuable. And I, I'm really honored that you're able to stick it out here the last 90 minutes. Thanks, Ed. Loving it. Great. Thank you all for being on Global TV Talk Show. I'd like this to go on, but I know that everyone has other things to do today. Um, the sun is shining here in Southern California, so I've got to go out and get some air. No, no <laughs> rain in California? The rain is stopped? Uh, it moved over to Phoenix and Colorado. <laughs> 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 it's, it's coming your way, James. <laughs> so everybody um, stay dry. Uh, so Tiniki, thank you for your words of leadership, uh, uniqueness. And Emily, your insight is just spot on, as James would say. <laughs> Annette, thank you for your heartfelt words. It's great. Sandrine, let's do it again. And uh, thank you, Dave, for co-sponsoring and being involved again. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll be back to you uh, in the next day or so. Um, I don't think this will need any editing, but I'll take a look. And uh, uh, it'll be full of megabytes. So <laughs> clear out your cache. <laughs> you'll you'll want to <laughs> see this one again, I think. And uh, please come back on Global TV Talk Show. We can do one-on-ones. You know, Emily and I have done one-on-ones all year, and I uh, hope you continue. And uh, so very quickly, Emily, you're so special with your background and in Toronto and now looking at Mexico and other places. You're even looking into this new country being formed in, along the Danube. Are you still I'm doing that? Working. I became a, a resident of this country, and in an hour I would have interview with one of the ministers. No, no I don't want to confuse other people, but yes, from one side I'm relocating uh, to Mexico part time, like planning to live part time in Mexico, in Canada. I have two citizenship and two. Uh, residencies and working my European passport, but my latest passion, I would say, Free Republic of Liberland, because I like this idea, I like of the new concept, not exactly new, but actually new country to be maybe leading um, Singapore of Europe as they plan to be. So yes, it's uh, I will share with you, Ed and others, on so our next one-to-one -one of this Ed interview, what I found about Liberland and other directions I'm working with. Fascinating. Thank you all. And uh, be back to you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.